This is a course on techniques to improve software reliability and to reduce software development cost. And contrary to what you may have heard, these are not mutually exclusive, as uh, you will find out during this course. I created this course when I was VP of development for uh, a leading market data provider, and I was hired specifically to implement company-wide improvements in quality, reliability, and reduce cost. In particular, this course was developed uh, after we acquired a real-time feed company, and one of my many tasks was to lead the integration of the real-time feed which we had acquired into the company and remove a number of obsolete and uh, at this point redundant feeds that we had in different parts of the company in different parts of the world. This uh, got off to a bit of a rocky start and one of my uh, one of the guys that used to work for my consulting business and joined me uh, when I joined this uh, joined this firm with me uh, came into my office one day and uh, said, uh, Dave, you're being remarkably ineffective to which I had to reply and tell me something I don't know. So he said, look, you know, in the consulting days, whenever we had a new engagement, you would gather around all the troops and you would go over with us a number of previous engagements or things that you'd seen in industry um, that had similar aspects or problems with the engagement we're about to start and use that as a way to get everybody on the same page with the approach you were gonna take with, uh, with the current engagement. And what I suggest is you put together a course for these guys and do it as a Socratic course where you introduce the important facts and try and get people to identify what's going wrong and how it might be put on track and use this as a means to get people to think about the kind of problems that we face. It's a lot easier to discuss problems in the abstract than to discuss them in the context of your day-to-day -day work and especially when you're trying to get people to change the way that they've been working when they've done something a certain way for years or decades in some cases. Um, so thanks, Scott, for that incredibly timely advice. Um, as we all saw, this proved to be a very effective course and was instrumental in the successful completion of that integration effort. Um, this course is from a while ago, 2005, uh, but it's still extremely relevant because unfortunately, we continue to see the kinds of mistakes uh, that are illustrated in these, these uh, cases um, quite often. Um, I've taught a number of more up-to-date versions of this course uh, several times in the embedded, uh, embedded systems development space for the Embedded Systems Conference. And uh, also I've done it as a guest lecturer for some university courses, but unfortunately I didn't record any of those. Um, so this version again was for part of the engineering team I led uh, integrating the uh, uh, newly acquired company and it was recorded for the team members in other parts of the world that were not able to attend this particular presentation and discussion. Um, I've edited out all the company specific parts. Um, and also at the end, you'll find in addition to all the uh, case discussions, uh, there's a general discussion on software best practices and uh, how they can be uh, rolled out at uh, an organization. So how to take this course. This is a set of case histories from my checkered past, and each case history has a discussion about the difficulties encountered by an engineering group and, and how it might be sorted. Um, so the introduction for each case has been paired. Uh, all the normal noise and chaos that you get at the beginning of a consulting engagement has been stripped. And uh, when you start an engagement on a problem where you have an engineering team off the rails, there are always uh, considerable cacophony of suggestions about what's really going wrong and how it should be fixed. Um, and part of the nature of that, that, in, that type of engagement is, is getting, to the, uh, getting to the meat of the problem and finding the minimum important facts that are really gonna lead you to how you're gonna fix it. Um, we're skipping that part today. This has been uh, pre-filtered to, produce, to, to uh, lead with only the salient facts that are the, the minimum facts necessary to understand the situation and understand how it can be fixed. So listen to the case introduction and there's a pause marker in the, in the video. Stop the video and make your notes about what you think is really going on with this team and how you might, how you might fix it, how you can get this team back on track. 
and only after you've written your notes and reviewed your notes and probably uh, it might be good to go back and also just repeat the uh, replay the case introduction uh, and make sure you've you think you've got a pretty good handle on what the problem is and how you can fix it then go ahead and listen to the group discussion and then at the end of each discussion um, you'll find the uh, actual resolution of how I was uh, what what tech what techniques I used and steps I took to uh, resolve the uh, the problem and get the engineering uh, uh, back on track for the particular engagement. So without further ado. Uh, thanks very much for, for, uh, for all your uh, for coming to, uh, to join us here. I should start, I guess, by introducing myself. Um, I'm Dave Nadler, and I, uh, I am the VP of uh, Software Development for TID. And uh, before I get going, I should tell a little story from um, last uh, a week ago, yesterday, actually, I was I was on my home, way, way home uh, quite late, and I had just received another invitation to speak at the FISD conference, for what reason, I have no idea. And uh, it was very much on my mind, and I stopped at our local uh, establishment to get a quick bite to eat late in the evening, and uh, the guy brought my, my food over, and he says, anything you need? And I said, uh, silverware. I just forgot to bring the silverware. And uh, he said, huh? And I said, yes, I know I mumble. Everybody tells me I mumble every time I give a talk. Uh, this is no really, I'll, uh, I just wasn't listening carefully. I, I said, silverware. And he went away and he brought me back a soda water. <laughs> so I was a little perplexed. It took me a little while to figure out what happened. So if I start mumbling or talking too fast, please uh, do interrupt me. Uh, it's an unfortunate uh, tendency of mine. Okay. Um, a little bit about myself and, uh, and then also why we're, why we're, uh, why we're here. Um, in my career, which is now, I'm reminded, uh, 32 years professionally developing uh, software and systems, um, I've, I've had a lot of different uh, opportunities to see uh, different ways of, of building uh, software and systems and different ways of testing software and systems and a lot of things that worked and a lot even more things that didn't work. Um, Prior to uh, my rejoining Interactive Data Corporation a couple of years ago, I ran my own consulting firm for uh, 18 years, um, and most of that time was spent uh, building products for other other companies. Um, I also have spent a lot of my career in uh, I don't know exactly how to describe it, but the the general uh, ritual is somebody shows up in my office and says, "Here's your tickets, go figure it out," um, and uh, so I. I got to see really, really quite a lot of uh, interesting um, attempts at developing systems and, and in the consulting business I've uh, been called upon to unwind the uh, uh, resulting, uh, you know, we're not, HR says we're not supposed to use words like catastrophe because that's emotionally charged, but anyway, catastrophes. <laughs> um, we collectively at IDC are working towards uh, what we generally call software uh, best practices. And I wish that we could find some books that would actually catalog and explain some of these a little bit better. A lot of these things are things that have been learned across industry uh, through a lot of, a lot of uh, pain. Um, but as a number of people have requested of me, it's, it's not terribly helpful to just say, well, do it this way. Um, and frankly, everybody ignores me anyway. Um, so what uh, what I've, I've done is uh, put together a few interesting episodes that I've been through in my career and uh, as a way to illustrate uh, ways of approaching or not approaching uh, testing in particular for, for, for today's um, discussion. So, let's start off with uh, a few old favorites. <clears throat> Some of these go back a few years, but as you'll see, the lessons actually are just as applicable today as, as they were uh, some decades past. Okay, so the first uh, story I'm going to talk about is a uh, about a company that did um, uh, remote ordering of, of flowers. And so basically you could go in to your local florist and you could order an arrangement of flowers to be delivered to um, uh, you know, your, your relative or your girlfriend or whatever. And there are still a number of companies that do this. Uh, it's a big source of revenue for the florists. Um, and all of the revenue in this business occurs on, I don't remember the particulars, I believe it's three days a year. 
So there's Easter and Mother's Day and Valentine's Day is a big one, and there might be one other one. But I mean, basically, a huge percentage of the revenue of this business occurs on, on those days. And a, uh, an entrepreneur had created a company to automate this process. And so um, anybody here remember the TI Silent 700 line of terminals? I'm really dating myself, I guess. That was a few people here. Um, TI produced a line of terminals with uh, thermal printing and an acoustic coupler on the back. And they, in particular, produced a line that had uh, bubble memory. And you could program these things with a little simple script. And so while the thing was offline, because remember back in this vintage, we're talking 1980, the cost of the telephone calls was a very big problem. They could fill out a form. So it would prompt them, and they'd type out the name and what floral arrangement and the address and the phone number and all of this information. And it would batch up these things in the memory of this little terminal. And then periodically, if the customer paid an extra fee, it would shoot the messages off, the one that was just entered plus anything stored. And otherwise, if anything was received, incoming it would then pull and pull back any stored messages. So you had a communications network, a central message switch, and should have been a very simple system. Well, a little background. I was working for a startup company which was not doing so well. And um, once again, we were in the mode of operation of, well, here's your ticket. Go figure it out. Make sure to build it up to cover your department's salary. Um, what happened? Well, it seems that every single major holiday, the thing crashed and lost most of the orders. And so um, before I tell you anything more, what can you tell me about what was going on? Lack of load testing. Lack of load testing. Anything else? Mm -hmm. uh, maybe just somebody uh, overwritten an array or something. No, I'm not a member. No, I think the real the real core of it is not doing not doing any any real load testing. So um, I asked about this. And they said, well, that's impossible. How are you going to test it? You need all these machines dialing in. Well, what's the alternative? Continue to crash every major holiday. And it was really quite spectacular. They had, um, they had um, a lot of florists had uh, taken to throwing them off buildings and taking pictures of them on the way down and then <laughs> on the ground and then sending the photographs along with the smashed terminal back. So I got an introduction to the consequences of not doing the testing. And uh, it transpired after a little bit of analysis. There were two possibilities. You know, you could have a problem with the actual communications network, um, or you could have a problem with the actual message switch. Now, it seemed to be the message switch, because what we had was corruption of messages and things like that at the, at the, at the center. And so um, after a little bit of calculation, I realized that we could actually simulate the peak holiday traffic with a small number of these terminals in a room if we merely avoided clearing the message every time it was sent. So each time an order was sent, it just stayed in the queue. And with some very small number of machines in a room smaller than this, we were able to simulate the peak load on the system. And um, this exercise required a small modification of the scripting so as not to clear but basically no major changes to the system. Now, it is important, though, that there was a small change to the system. But with a very small change to the system, in a matter of a few minutes, we're able to generate a load test, which, in fact, proves conclusively that there was no way in hell that the message, uh, the, the, the message system could sustain the traffic volume required by the application. Uh, that exercise up until that point took I want to say about two days. Um, and then I was asked, of course, to look at alternate vendors and figure out how to actually dig out of this hole. Um, the unfortunate punchline to the story, um, I was called to deliver my analysis to the board of directors of this outfit. And um, I started explaining how it really wasn't a terrifically big problem. We just merely had to run some small tests. We could easily find and verify whether vendor A or vendor B could in fact hold, handle the, the volumes required. 
And the people in the room looked at me like they were ready to kill me. People were turning red. People were. And I had no idea what I could have possibly done to have everybody really clearly furious. And then I found out after the fact that my boss, uh, the, the guy who was the head of the startup, who was a very fancy professor and had been dean of the Sloan School and all this other nonsense, very highly regarded chap, had been the technical consultant to the board for something like three years during this period. So he was invited immediately to leave the board and his advisorship position. So doing a good job sometimes has unexpected consequences. Anyway, a very, a very um, useful example of you know, what happens if you, don't do, uh, if you don't do tests and how you can do tests that are not necessarily what you would at first imagine you are required to, uh, to get to the meat of it. And if in a system like this, you know, obviously uh, there are a lot of ways you could do unit tests. In fact, because of the nature of the system, unit tests are almost self-automating. All you again have to do is don't clear the messages in one of these things, and you can just turn it on and see if the thing pumps various kind of messages around the system. A uh, testing and communication system is a little tougher, which I'm sure you, you guys are familiar with. Um, but in this case, that really had nothing to do with the commercial, commercial problem. So, OK. I, I kind of like this. That was 1980, if I recall collectively. Right. 20 years later, uh, 2000, a um, customer of my consulting firm calls up and says, um, you've got to come help. We know that you don't take these assignments, but we're a really good customer, so you have to. We want you to come and fix this group that's clearly broken. And the group was producing a product which is a, um, it's a, it's a kind of specialty kind of uh, financial reporting. And if you get your mutual fund statements, there are certain required reports that are in the, uh, that are there standard SEC reports for mutual funds. And producing these things is uh, a surprisingly difficult exercise. Anyway, this is a very specialized reporting package that deals specifically with those kind of reports. So the first thing they told me about this group was, the first thing I thought was notable about this group is, you know, when you say it's broken, what do you mean it's broken? Well, they can't get a version of the software that works. What do you mean? Every time they fix something, they break something else. The number of bugs remains constant. Can you go <laughs> I thought that one went up. <laughs> but it, it was like, you know, bouncing along at some very large number of critical bugs. And, and uh, they didn't seem to be able to get the, the thing to a point where it was close to being able to satisfy their customer requirements. So without my telling you anything more, what can you tell me about what was going on in that group? Lack of regression testing. No regression testing. What else? Somebody else wasn't doing the testing. I'm sorry? Somebody else, you know, they weren't. The guys that were building it were not were doing the testing, so they kind of. No, they actually had a separate QA. Yeah. Probably also. I think they were doing all the human tests, not the system yeah. tests. Right. right. Yeah, they were just doing piece piece uh, unit unit, unit tests. Yeah. But the biggest problem actually was. I come back. Other ideas. Other ideas. That's that's. Very well, tightly coupled. Um, not unusually so. More than more than some systems, but not. Uh, not, not terribly so. Uh, other other thoughts about what might have been going on? Too many versions. Too many versions. Oh, they hadn't got to version one, so they're. <laughs> <laughs> too, many, too many versions of the program floating around. No, no, they hadn't. Wasn't modular enough. Yeah, too many. Yeah. Requirements changing. No, the requirements were stable. Uh, no, no clear ownership of the code. No, it's one group that owned the code. It's reasonably modular code. But they defined requirements? Requirements weren't that bad. But let me tell you a few things about the QA department. Um, because I got a lot of pushback about some of the changes that I made. Um, and uh, so I, I went and I tried to investigate what was what was going on with the oh Michael Scott. Um test for repeatable. Yeah, bingo. No repeatable tests, right? 
So looking at the QA department, what I found out was they had no written test procedures for what they were going to test. So they'd fire it up, poke at it, write down a few problems. When they wrote down a few problems, they considered their job was done. Okay? So we don't actually know that the bug rate was constant. It may have been going down. The number of open bugs was constant. Right? But they had no repeatable tests in the sense of a, a set of things they were going to follow. They also didn't have a repeatable set of data that they used. So they would just kind of fire it up with whatever data was lying around and poke around at it. And one of the most amazing things that happened during that period was I went and I told them about how we were going to change the testing and what we were going to do about it. And they said, that's, that's, you know, that's completely ridiculous. We have a professional QA department, and it's completely unnecessary to do that. And I was embarrassed and forced to point out to them that the last QA cycle they had done, the programmers had introduced a bug whereby all data was reported in the wrong period, and they hadn't caught it. So anyway, that pretty much put an end to that discussion. But they actually had no automated regression tests, and they also had no, uh, no standard set of data. Because this kind of application, this is a reporting against the database, and because the application is doing, it's kind of doing two things. It's reporting information in the database, and it's also allowing you to do all kinds of fancy formatting of the report. You've got to sort of test both things, right? So you go through all kinds of user interface interactions to format what you want to see on the screen, pull this out of the database, pull that out of the database, adjust it this way, total it that way. And then you're supposed to be able to take this report template and apply it to the different periods as you, as you, as you roll along uh, time-wise. So they didn't have a reference database with very clear numbers. So for example, all of the numbers in the first quarter end with one take some very, very simplistic approach that makes it easy to identify what you're looking at. Right? They were trying to use real data where it would have been much, much easier had they used constructed data to be able to see in the, in the results what actually they were, what they were getting back. Right? They had no idea what they were seeing. Right? If any one of those numbers in any one of those reports, it couldn't tie it to anything unless they were going to go write SQL queries, which they certainly weren't going to do in the, in the, in the QA department in this, in this organization. So what we did was, um, was twofold. First of all, we actually changed the application so that it was easily, uh, we, we had to change some things to make it more easily scriptable. Uh, this, is, this happens a lot with Windows GUI applications especially. It's very easy to build things that don't actually uh, work with, with the testing tool. It makes it hard to, hard to create test scripts. And we also made it from the application possible to reinitialize the database from a set of known reference test databases that represented a different set of uh, kind of different kind of data environments that we wanted to, to, to check because there, there are different kinds of, of uh, uh, I'm not doing a very good job of explaining this. There, there, there are some different structures of the financial information that, that you need to test. And they're, they're sort of disjunct. You know, you could have uh, uh, be reporting on a fund that was structured in method A or B or C, and there's no there's no overlap. So we had to construct a set of reference cases that we can then script against. And we also changed the application so that from the GUI you could say, okay, clear out the database and initialize it from from one of these reference sets. Now you could create an easily runnable script, right, front to back with known data, known behavior. And we also did something which is not so common, which is that we made every developer able to access these tests. We created what we call a smoke test or a sanity test, which is very, very shallow but very broad. Hits all of the major functions lightly. Every developer had to run that test before they checked any change in the, into, back into source control. And once they checked something into source control, they had to check everything back out, rebuild it, rerun it in case they made a mistake with the source control. And then we had much deeper tests for each one of the pieces of functionality. So by doing that, we were able to very quickly prevent adding to the bug count and, and get. Uh, so that, 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 uh, that product uh, then uh, was successfully shipped in a matter of, um, I, I want to say it was, a, I think it was two and a half months, three months, something like that. Um, but mostly it was, a, it was not a what you would classically call a development problem. It was a, you know, how are you doing development with, with QA? 
Um, one of the things that uh, somebody pointed out that I, I should have picked up on and I actually hadn't from the symptoms, uh, one of the things that uh, you, can, you can also imply in a situation like that where, where you, you seem to be having a, a lot of problem keeping the bug count from, from uh, either going up or staying constant is staff changes. In fact, there were a number of staff changes which had left them in a position of not being as familiar with the code as, as, as possible. If you look at failure rates for code, it looks like, um, I guess it's an incandescent light bulb that's got the curve that goes like this. Do it this way, right? And software, software failure rates look like that, bug rates look like that, right? You guys have all seen those curves, right? Bathtubs. Huh? Bathtubs. Bathtubs, yeah. Why do they look like that? Because you're seeing it during initial development, you start seeing the, the main stuff that just flows to the surface, the obvious ones, and then as they get deeper in the development, you sort of don't test as much, and then as you get near and near release, when people really start looking and focusing on it. No, most of those curves are actually over a longer period. They're, yeah. It's like, you, you know, you get through the initial release, and you have some, you know, the first release is pretty buggy, and then it, right. then it gets stable, and it stays stable for a while, and then it tends to, it tends to I'm going the wrong way, I'm sorry, it tends to hook back up again after some number of releases. Okay, so why does that happen? Probably because you might be putting an awful lot of band-aids in the code to do enhancements. Yeah, it's certainly one reason. People start trying to stretch the thing to do things that weren't originally in the design. What's another reason that happens, though? Maybe different developers are working on it? Absolutely. Absolutely. We'll take the hot shots and put them on the new project. Well, whether they were the hot shots or not the hot shots, at least they were the people that had the head knowledge. When you have a lot of staff turnover, you tend to see that kind of situation uh, arising. And, and um, you know, that, that can also happen when, when you have consultants doing development, right? Which is, you know, I think a somewhat familiar problem where you, you know, you get to a certain point, well, okay, now people aren't familiar with the way they did it or the tools or whatever else. And then you, you end up with, a, with an uptick in, um, in problems. I'm sorry, I keep going the wrong way. You have to look in the mirror when I do it. Another one I heard was NASA saying a lot of their bugs came from people fixing prior bugs who didn't understand the first bug completely. Yeah, but the, the key point there is not understanding completely is a symptom of probably not the same staff. It's, less, it's statistically much less likely to happen if it's the original developers. Mm -hmm. Not that it doesn't happen, certainly I do that. Anyway, so it's kind of an interesting, interesting thing. And I hadn't actually thought about that, but... Uh, when I first heard the description of you know what was what was happening in that in that group, but um, anyway, that went out to be a successful product. You probably all received mutual funds that are reported with the thing. Jumping back in time again, 1993. This was kind of a periodically I do these things. I shouldn't take dares. It's just a bad idea, but. Some of us just can't help ourselves. The situation was a, a company that had a product that was having its market share taken away at a fairly good clip by a competing product because it was lacking a specific piece of functionality that was really needed in the market. And the company that was responsible for this thing didn't have the technical staff able to do what needed to be done here. So they went around and they, they put it out for bid. And mostly what happened was people came back and told them that they were completely out of their minds and it couldn't be done because the time frame, I believe, was six months and there were no specs. So it was a complete design build. And, um, but they were willing to pay a lot of money. And people told me it couldn't be done. And so I couldn't help myself. But I did, however, ask all the folks that worked on it first if they really wanted to do this, because there were going to be a lot, a lot of long, uh, long nights and uh, overtime on that project. The other thing that was kind of nasty about the way the contract was structured were there pretty serious penalties if I was late. They unfortunately would not agree to bonus for being early, but uh, very, very serious penalties for being late. And also, they demanded a warranty on the code, which basically meant that if there were any problems, I had to fix it very promptly, and that's a big problem for a little little shop like I had because uh, if, if you know it's a huge disruption you know, if, if you have to all of a sudden put something else on hold, which is of course on deadline, and cause all kind of disruption to go and look at a problem. So it's very very expensive. Bugs in general are very very expensive. We can talk a little bit about that one later. 
So, but anyway, it was it was a dare, it was a lot of money, and everybody, all the guys said, yeah, well, we'll go for it, take the summer off or something. So, so we um, we charged on, and um, we delivered the first uh, initial really an evaluation copy with a lot of known holes in the functionality, but mock-ups for the pieces that were missing. Something they could look at, something they could get a good good, uh, good handle on how it was going to be, even if it wasn't completely functional at that point in time. And one of the um, rather horrendous mistakes I made in that particular deal was I agreed that their QA department would do the testing. So we delivered this thing, and a few days later, I get back a list of some 200 bugs. I don't know. At least 100 anyway. And all of them were of the form, this dialogue doesn't have our company look and feel. But there was no functional testing. And then I also had to go inform them and explain that the contract said that the application would follow the Windows style guidelines and that one of the big customer complaints was their custom company look and feel that they were abolishing that in the next release of the product. And in fact, we're busily working on that while we were building this piece. So, what do you do? What do you do in that situation? You're on the hook for a lot of money if they're bugs. You've got a very tight time frame. Right? It's going to cost you a bloody fortune if the thing is late because there are all these penalty clauses. What are you going to do? Keep the idea itself. Okay. Test it yourself. Yeah. We're bringing your own QA team, not the developers. Or just write your own test book. Yeah, I would give them guidance into the area that they should be concentrating on more right. closely. Yeah. Okay, giving guidance to a customer <laughs> it's rarely easy it's always a good idea and, and it never um, works maybe before I die I'll see it work um, you know that that is in fact you know sort of always my first reaction and was in fact in the previous the previous example okay look let's work with the QA department and, and figure out how we're going to uh, how we're going to in fact uh, get a set of tests in place that are actually going to test what they need to test. You know, forget about whether it, you know whether the dialogues look the way you want them. Let's, let's make sure the functional tests are correct. And if you want to go and make a pass over it later and clean up all the language and the color of the dialogues, fine. But let's let's get the meat done quick. But what happens in a lot of these situations, and in fact, in both this story and the previous story I told you, was that the QA department was set against using automated tests. Not philosophically, but they didn't know how to do it. They hadn't training, they hadn't the tools, they didn't know what it meant. So, in fact, you know, you're absolutely right. What I did was I went and hired QA folks out of my own pocket because it was going to be less expensive for me to do this, right, than to have the consequences of not having the code tested properly and either deliver it late or. Um, you know, have have uh, have a lot of warranty claims on the on the product when it was when it was delivered. So in fact, we did that. We we used uh, automated that we used SQA robot, which is if anybody knows what that is for testing that particular product. This goes back a few years. I think it's currently resurfaced as IBM Rational. What do they call it now? It's got a different name now. They don't call it robot. Anyway, you guys don't do Windows GUIs a lot, so you probably don't want to talk about. And uh, if you are ever faced with a, with a situation like that, you should always think about making lemonade out of lemonades and sell the customer the test suite um, at additional cost. Um, and that product was delivered on time and also went out to be a successful product. And um, in spite of spending some money on, on QA, it actually, having the QA folks in the same organization working tightly with development in that case caused us to be able to really quickly, you know, focus the testing on where it needed to be focused and, and um, make sure that the tests were in a fashion that, uh, in, uh, in, a, in a state where the developers could easily run the tests 
you know, having, having, them, having a very tight connection between the developers and the QA facilitated development. Because now we could get really, really quick tests, turn around on tests, and start using the stuff as regression testing, as opposed to the contractual situation, which is deliver something to the customer once every you know, two and a half weeks or whatever it was, and wait a week for them to reply with a bug list. Which I, you know, in hindsight, I should, should shoot myself for ever, for ever agreeing to a contract like that. Anyway, but it was uh, also uh, on time, profitable, and a very successful product. A great reviews in PC Week and lots of other obligations. The next story is, I think, everybody's favorite. It's, it's uh, you have to, I'm not making this up. Before I, before I tell you, this, this really happened. This is true. Somebody had this great idea that you shouldn't have to stop at toll booths and hand the money and get change. And that we should be able to have little transponders that go in the windshield and be able to blaze through the tolls and brighten our lives by doing a 2000 so. Anyway, uh, my, my firm helped an entrepreneur develop a prototype system. Um, I don't remember the years. That, that would have been in the early 90s. Um, which he then had a demonstration system that was good enough to go out and secure venture funding and whatnot. And they went off and they got their venture funding. And I don't remember exactly what happened. We were busy with some other projects. And they ended up hiring an engineering team. Uh, so we weren't really supposed to be involved in this. And some, they were some ways down the road in, in development. And uh, uh, they called up and said, can you guys build all the back-end database systems that keep track of the transponders and you know who's paid what and how many tolls each transponder is used. It's kind of interesting because it's a distributed database problem. They didn't want anything, everything interconnected because, again, at that point in time, the telecoms costs were a significant uh, issue. So sure, that sounds like a fun project. So, so one of my guys shows up at, the, uh, at the, uh, the outfit at the point of date to deliver the software that we have dutifully made. And they've reviewed the specifications. They've signed off on everything. We show up. We've done our own testing on all this stuff. We show up with all the all the equipment to start integration testing. And um, this is the guy, the guy that worked, he called me up in a total panic. He says, you're not going to believe this, but there's nothing here. It's very interesting. So what do you mean there's nothing here? Well, there's like nothing to hook up for. They've got a bunch of machines, and they've got a bunch of wires, and they've got a lot of engineers that are running around screaming at each other. But you know, nobody, like they look at me funny when I ask, like, when are we going to start doing system integration? So I, I, um, I decided maybe I should go and have a visit and see what the hell was going on. So I went up there unannounced. And um, this outfit was, um, was an actually the guy who started this company is still located in the same facility. It's really funny. It's an old, um, an old building in, uh, in Marblehead. Uh, and it's a sail loft. The, the top floor of the building is, a, is an old style sail loft. So it had these huge beautiful polished floors, absolutely smooth, not anything sticking up that could snag us, just gorgeous, you know. And they'd like taken this beautiful place and they, you know, stuck partitions up and just made a total hash of it, but they still had this one big open area. So I go up there and I walk in and I walk upstairs to see what's going on. And I really figured I shouldn't call first because they're going to have some story for me and if I just walk in I might be able to figure it out. So I walk in, what do I see? You just have to imagine this. It's just there's an engineer, and he's like, "Wait, this is like this. This room is like three times the length of this this room here." And this guy is running towards me in his socks, holding a transponder. And he gets up to full tilt, and he gets about two thirds of the way down the room, and he slides, he breaks into this beautiful slide, holding out the transponder. <laughs> and he goes by, you know. The antenna that's supposed to trigger the transponder and the antenna that's supposed to interact with the transponder and slides to a stop at the end where they got a bank of computers and a whole bunch of engineers standing around. And there's dead silence for a while, and everybody stares at the computers at the end of the hall there. And nothing happened. They all start screaming at each other at the top of their lungs. Okay. What's going on? What can you tell me about what has happened here? Engineering testing. <laughs> there is it. <laughs> what can you tell me about what's going on? 
Not a good environment, testing environment. More specifics? Not that you consider the slide an automated test. <laughs> it's really impressive. <laughs> and it was obviously well kept. The guy had obviously done it a whole bunch of times because he stopped just in the right place. You know? Just smashing face first up to the mic. Just missing a face plant into the wall of computers at the end of the, the, end of the, end of the room there. I think they were still in human development. If they were puzzled when you said in when they brought up integration testing, then maybe they had not, you know, even integrated their own pieces with each other. Okay. You know, or and or unit tested them on their own. Okay, keep going. What else what else can you tell me about what's what what what's what's going on with the school dimensions? They never thought about how they're gonna test. Certainly never thought about how they're gonna test. Standardize the socks. Because they didn't use well they, they thought about it because I think that guy didn't use to wear socks, but <laughs> <laughs> Didn't they could have used some kind of simulator for this mechanical you know, electrical system instead of kind of zooming around with this time. So you think they should have had the thing whizzing down the hall and pulling? Some kind of simulator in the software simulator. <laughs> <laughs> that was probably the problem. It worked in software. It's the real response didn't work. The, 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 the testing is obviously al fresco and based on an afterthought rather than having been devised ahead of the specs. Okay, why are they all shouting at each other? It's not working. Yes, well, we know it's not working. <laughs> it's, it's somebody else's problem. Somebody else's right. problem? Yeah. No, what does that mean, it's somebody else's problem? What's going on here? No accountability. The transponders don't work? <laughs> Unit testing. One of the guys said the transponders didn't work, but the other guys were the guy that built the transponder was bigger than some of the other guys. Yeah, that were, argument was, <laughs> there were only there weren't any established specs for getting the stuff to connect to each other, so they they were wondering why, you know, everybody's yelling yours doesn't work, yours doesn't work, and everybody is sort of looking at the wrong place for Okay, but if they're all yelling yours doesn't work, what does that tell you? The, it, 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 the, the spelling the word engineer starting the the O. The units haven't been tested to know which. It tells you there's no diagnostic capability between all of the different pieces of the system. Right? If there was a record of what happened between this system and this system, and this system and this system, and this system and this system, and this system we would know what was working and what wasn't working, right? Okay, so no diagnostic capability between the different components of the system. So, and also, a corollary to that. Hmm? Also seems very poor project management, the fact that you guys showed up, presuming he would do system integration. I know, I, come, I sometimes well, actually the, believe people will do their work, but anyway, it's a character fault, I know. So weren't Sarbanes-Oxley compliant? Oh, it was a long time before Sarbanes-Oxley. It was 95. I'm not sure that's the right date. Uh, yeah, well, okay, so... The system interfaces between all the different components didn't have any diagnostic capabilities, so there's no logging built in anywhere, so you couldn't actually tell what was happening. But a very close corollary of no logging is no playback capability, which means no good testing capability, right? In other words, they didn't have a facility that could play into one of the antennas what was supposed to happen at a certain point, you know, just like a wake-up signal. They didn't have a system that could exercise any of the, this thing had a lot of different pieces that had different functions that had to work in a chain, which probably sounds a little bit familiar. And what you need to be able to do is you need to be able to test the systems individually. So you need, you need record capability, you need playback capability, you need comparison capability so you can you know, play something in, see what happens, record the results, compare them to the expected results. Basic testing. So no unit testing capability. So the concept of system integration is kind of foolish because um, yes, they had specifications for every interface, but each piece is implemented with somebody else's understanding of the, of the specification, right? So uh, that, that system um, was, uh, was, 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 a, was a bit of a, uh, let's see, HR says we're not supposed to use emotionally charged words. It's hard to figure, like, figure out how to describe stuff like this, but uh, what happened was, um, uh, we were asked to please you know, intervene and, and, and try and clean up the wreckage, and it was unfortunately uh, fairly, fairly late into the process, and in fact, 
Um, they were supposed to be installing demonstration equipment. And so one of my engineers ended up, I think he quit right after this, he ended up debugging part of their software in a tunnel underneath a, a toll booth in Chicago. And uh, it was not, not taken well by him or his wife. Anyway, um, interestingly enough, the, uh, the, the, that particular device was not a commercial success. However, they, they did develop a lot of interesting technology and patents, and that was uh, eventually acquired and is now part of what we now know as, uh, um, I guess, Easy Pass. And there's another name for it here. Is it? I'm not sure. There's a couple of different names. Easy Pass is here. Easy Pass is here. Isn't it Speed Pass? Yeah. yeah. It's, it's the same. same, system. same system. Yeah. That company ended up acquiring all the, all the technology. So the, the, it's, it's kind of interesting because the, the technology was a bit of a disaster um, because of the way it was developed, not because there were any fundamental problems with what they were trying to do. But they, the, uh, the people that funded it still managed to come out of it in reasonably, reasonably good shape, though. I think a lot of engineers lost their minds. It's working with McDonald's or something. I don't know. Someone should. I'm not supposed to say it. Um, so what? What? Um, what else? What else can you tell me about what was going on? Any other? Any other thoughts? Is there some other description? Michael, what would you? How would you approach testing something like that? What would you? What? What other thoughts do you have? Well, one of the things is that uh, you touched on it. Uh, what I, what I consider tech points, and all the components should have tech points for uh, seeing what's going on. Um, but also, when you design a product, you have to design it with the, the mind, the test, the time, and the test. So all those uh, hooks seem to be in there. Yeah. And it's, it's um, integration testing in a system like that needs to be kind of stepwise, right? So you need to, you know, Unit test the first piece, unit test the second piece, now bridge the two of them together, test the set, unit test the third piece, right? It's sort of with the, the in game in mind. It's not yeah. only just silo sort of uh, approach to think of, you know, what is the in game? This piece is going to generate this. So what are all the components that are involved with it? Yeah. You know, holistic approach. It's, it's interesting in that, um, well, not so obvious from the outside without knowing how, how this thing worked, but it's kind of similar to the way um, the, the Comstock uh, infrastructure works in that you have a chain of processing. You know, so this piece has to do something and shoot something out. The next piece has to do something with it and shoot something out. And each piece may have some state information and you have a chain and you need to sort of figure out, okay, well, how are you going to test each piece and then how are you going to test the larger, the larger um, um, It's Systems like that are, are also hard to test um, because they have um, they have a lot of funny uh, they're much they have a lot of funny timing characteristics and you have to test edge cases like differing signal strengths right what you know does the thing behave sensibly and does it operate at the, at the at the correct thresholds and some of that stuff you, you just you can do it on a unit a unit level so for example you know the transponder some kind of test environment to make sure that the transponder re behaves at a certain signal level which might be on the margin or something. What's also the of the vehicles and so forth? Yeah. They actually had, the, the, not, not this uh, action system, the prototype system, they actually had the uh, New Hampshire State Troopers testing the thing. And they had they, these, these characters decided to have contests to see how fast it worked. And they actually had the trooper go through the, whole, the hook set toll booth at 95 miles an hour in the middle of the night. Unbelievable. I think they stopped. <laughs> Thank God they didn't have to buy with yeah. employees in the room this morning. Yeah. I, probably. They do have concrete barriers, you know, but at that speed, I don't think... Uh, Did it work in 85? Yeah. <laughs> don't try it! Please. Uh, I bet you the New Jersey Express lines won't go that, that they don't have any unusual speed limits on those, but they're just wide open. It's interesting, interesting technology. And, uh, it costs more money for us to get that system sort of working. Um, in consulting after the fact than it would have cost had we built the system from scratch. It's unbelievable. And purely because of the fact that they hadn't understood, you know, the, the fundamental engineering was, 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 was decent. Well, that's the price, that's the expense of real. Just the How different was the final system from the first one? Um, it's it's fairly diff different. They had a uh, a notion that they were going to have the uh, uh, they they were going to have the uh, 
it was going to be like a postage meter, you know, so it had a certain amount of money in it. Um, and then you would have to stop and give it to somebody and give them some money or give them give a charge card. So there was like a recharge station at, a toll, at the toll booth. And you would stop and say, you know, put 25 bucks in it. So um, that was a really bad idea from a traffic point of view. I don't know why anybody thought that was, was sensible. But it was also, I think credit cards weren't quite as ubiquitous. Um, you know, it's 10 years ago. And uh, it seems kind of obvious that that was a bad idea. Otherwise, fairly similar. There's a beacon that wakes the device up as you approach the toll booth. Because it needs to be off. Uh, you know, it really needs to be off. Otherwise, the battery wouldn't last very long. Right? So there's a, an RF, uh, a certain amount of RF energy on a certain frequency will kick the thing and wake it up. And it wakes up and then it figures out what's the charge. And it does a little, little uh, dance back and forth with the, uh, the equipment proof. So that stuff is, I think, um, reasonably uh, reasonably similar. Obviously, the technology, the IC technology and the RF technology, uh, uh, that we, and, the, and really the power consumption of a lot of components that we have to work with now as compared to, as, as compared to 1995. 1995, it was pretty difficult create something that was going to have the meat power, uh, power requirements. But uh, it's a little, little easier now. Anyway, that was a favorite story. This one actually happened at IDC. My first stint at IDC back in 1984. Um, there was a software product called Nobody, nobody here remembers. Anybody remember XM? You, you guys probably remember XM. You remember? <laughs> you remember XM? Okay. <laughs> um, yeah, this was the last thing I did in my last in the nineties. XM had been maintained by a group. You remember the NTD group back then? This is maybe this is before you were around. Yeah, before. Yeah. And um, they had actually got to the point where they could not produce a working copy of the code from sources. Um, and what, has, what happened was uh, the thing was built, there were, there were kind of two modes of building it. You could build it for the commercial VM operating system, VMCMS, or you could build it for the IDC custom operating system, ESCS. And a new version of VM came out. and. Customers who were paying, as I recall, $100,000 a year for maintenance, and the license was like half a million or three quarters of a million. It's very expensive mainframe software product. They were fairly incensed when a new version of VM came out. We couldn't deliver something that actually ran on it. Um, so this created a little bit of a business issue, and I was asked to please um, take over that group and fix the problem. So what do you think was going on in a situation like that? Why? Why would... Why would a maintenance group get in a situation where they couldn't produce a copy that worked? Source control. A lot of problems with source control, yeah. What else? From what you're saying, you're implying shifting environment. Yeah. They couldn't produce a copy that worked for ESCS. Never mind the end. Having a good grip on OS specific calls and yeah, so that it wasn't portable. Seems no, like they, sort they, of portability. They, they, they couldn't build for either system. They couldn't build for either system. So that that was an ongoing problem with that thing because it was primarily delivered on ESCS and then every once in a while we did a build for VM CMS and OS dependencies would sometimes creep in. But that in that wasn't really that was that was in the noise at this point because they really couldn't build one that worked for ESCS. Yeah, it sounds like they got away from uh, regression testing. So no regression testing. The problem on immediately to it. So, yeah, so the first thing we had to do was, was set about um, putting in place some source control, um, working backwards to a previous known version that actually worked, and then trying to build regression tests for each of the major components. Uh, again, broad, not deep, uh, kind of a smoke test for each major component. Um, and then uh, then move forward with the changes. And that process took, and also hiring somebody else to run the group, um, and that process took, um, and it took a number of months before that thing was back on its feet. But one of the key things, again, was, was coming up with um, trying to figure out an uh, appropriate set of test cases that we're going to, you know, because you, you can go crazy with the, with the testing, and you can make millions and millions and millions of tests for something like that. 
like that. It won't solve your problem. You, know, you have to figure out what's the what's what's the appropriate uh, appropriate level. Um, I like the idea of smoke test that you mentioned earlier. You know, shallow test doesn't shallow we find everything, but we'll definitely find if somebody broke. You broke yeah. something major, yeah. Yeah. One one of the big problems we have. Um, certainly saw it in the, um, uh, the the 2000 thing where, uh, where I was asked to come in and fix this group. What, there's, a, there's a big tendency when, when the tests aren't highly automated, people tend to test the stuff that changed. You know, and you can tell them what you need to test across, but everybody always focuses on the stuff that changed. And you don't, so, and this, this plagues us. Uh, we have periodic disasters. Now, HR would tell me we don't have disasters, we have events. Anyway. Spectacular um, events. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, be, because that, you know, because we have we have some areas where we don't have good tests, and, and that's exactly what happened. Everybody will focus on testing just the change that made, and they broke something that's you know a ways away because there's a piece of code that's used for related processing and they didn't see it. Okay, I'll tell one more story, and then we can talk about some more general stuff and also a little bit about. This is, a, this is one that I, it's kind of a personal engineering exercise I did. Um, any, anybody here pilots? Pilots? No, a couple pilots. One in the back there, yeah. Well, you mean real pilots. <laughs> what did you think I meant? <laughs> <laughs> the one who drives the plane. Yeah. Yeah, the pilots. No. pilots. Yeah. Okay, <laughs> pilots. Yeah. So, uh, uh, one of my, um, it's one of my um, most unfortunate addictions anyway. Um, and one of the things I do in my copious spare time is I, I, uh, I, I race uh, a glider to sailplanes. And I also um, shouldn't get involved in things like this. Somebody told me it couldn't be done and then one thing led to another. And anyway, so I design instrumentation um, that's used in a lot, of, uh, a lot of racing gliders. It currently flies in racers and I don't know, last time I counted it was at least 20 countries around the world. Anyway, so one of the issues that we have in, a, in an aircraft like that is trying to figure out what the wind is doing. Because one of the things you do when you're racing gliders is you try to get back to the runway with the minimum amount of altitude. Because any extra altitude is time you spend climbing that takes time, it takes additional time, and you're trying to go as fast as possible when you're racing these things. You can't arrive at ground level with no extra energy because you're going to kill yourself. You have no safety margin if you do that. But what you do have to do is you have to manage your safety margin uh, so that you arrive with, you know, ideally exactly the safety margin, but it gives you this cushion. And if you're trying to glide back to an airport in, in, into a, you know, a humongous headwind, it takes a lot more altitude than if you're gliding back to that same airport with a, with a huge tailwind. So a very big problem is, okay, what's the wind doing? If you have a GPS track and you have a compass and you have true airspeed, you have two vectors, and the difference between the two vectors is the wind, right? Everybody gets that? I'll go too fast? Yep, okay. If you have no compass and you have true airspeed, which is the situation for the instrument I happen to have designed, you have, instead of the difference between a, you, instead of a, a, a vector, you have a circle. In other words, you know the magnitude, you just don't know the direction. So you have a set of possible solutions, which is the difference between the circle and the vector. And if you do this over multiple observations, you can figure out the wind. I won't bore you with the math. Don't, I don't commit mathematics in public. But don't you get direction from the GPS? Yes, but that's only for the GPS track. That's one of the two vectors. So you have that one as a complete vector. But as far as which direction the aircraft is pointed, yeah. you don't know that. I'm, I'm a little confused. I mean, the GPS can certainly tell you the direction. Now, the GPS tells, let's suppose, let's suppose a huge wind from the side. Yeah. Okay, so I'm pointed this way. Which direction am I moving over the ground? I'm moving like that. Right. Okay. The glider is pointed this way. The GPS track is like that. Okay. The difference is the wind. One vector, two vectors. I that, but the GPS. Let's not do math in public. It's a bad idea. Um, anyway, so. I had some ideas about how to solve the system of equations, and I wrote down lots of nasty equations. And then the question is, okay, how do you do this? How do you go from 
nasty equations that might work to a commercial product. Ideas? Ideas? What, implement the software and then test it? Calibrate it. Prototype. Yeah. How? Test it. How? You record those same telemetry you'd have on a plane during a flight and then see if you can play it back and use it to try and map back to what right. actually happened. Right. right. So what we did was we took, a, we took a variety of aircraft out and we went and did exactly what we measured the sensor inputs, recorded the sensor inputs on days where we had very good wind measurements from meteorological observations. Okay, so we had uh, test data sets that were uh, different kinds of aircraft that have different kinds of error in their measurement systems on different kinds of days, which present different problems to the algorithms, and then we did all of the stuff. And, uh, and did all the debugging and, and, uh, and uh, got, that, got that, uh, that done. Interestingly, a number of the other manufacturers of these equipment didn't do it that way. They just wrote some, wrote some software and went fluid and said, yeah, well, it seems to work okay. So anyway, needless to say, they are not market leaders. But uh, the idea that you should do the test data first is very, very, very important, not just for glider instruments. We take it for granted that a certain amount of testing is done on products that we use every day. We take it for granted that the cars that we drive have a huge amount of testing that has gone into the braking systems and the ignition systems and the fuel injection systems. And the smallest little change, you know, creates huge problems, right? Mercedes just had an enormous recall because of, what was it, a material change in a fuel injector or something like that? caused all these things to start dying all over the place. Doesn't take much. And, uh, and the testing is, is, is really important. The, the aircraft that I fly are, um, when, the, when they design a new one, they do, uh, they do very detailed flutter tests. And they also do structural tests where they, they actually uh, destroy, destroy a set of wings. Um, if anybody's interested in that kind of stuff, I've got some interesting videos and also some pictures from a friend of mine that rebuilt a, a wreck, which I it's a long story. Anyway, I've got some good pictures if you're interested in that. But testing is really about economics, as is everything else we talk about in best practices. Um, we are trying, in, in best practices in general, not just in testing, to do things in a manner which leads to more reliable results more reliable in the sense of we know that it's going to take us a certain amount of time and we're going to actually achieve the desired result. More reliable in the sense of quality, in the sense of you know, it doesn't break every time we have a new release with all kind of random things going wrong because we haven't, haven't got good test coverage. Uh, why, why would you not test something? Can anybody think of an example where it, it, it might be inappropriate to test something? Continental missiles. <laughs> well, a lot of times it's just resources aren't there to do it. That's the main reason why it's not You mean reasons why we don't test or reasons why it would not be appropriate? Reasons it would not be appropriate. Well, we'll, we'll, come, we'll come back to that one. <laughs> Thanks, Paul. Huh? 105 hertz? Depends if you need it to work or not. So you, you test the pieces of it and hope that they work together. Yeah, like like you, like you do with a rocket, you test all the pieces and then hope that they integrate together at the right moment. Yeah, but I mean rockets are tested. They're sent up with test payloads. Ultimately, you know, first shot is a dis yeah. dispensable payload, and every piece of it's tested and tested and tested until until it's integrated. Sir. Yeah. But you know, like for instance, um, what was it? But I believe it was I was just talking to Mike about it. Uh, Porsche had a car that I think Bill Gates once bought. That they wouldn't let customs because it wasn't crash tested, and Porsche said it was crash tested. It's still sitting in a warehouse somewhere. It was for yeah. many years. Mm -hmm. the, the, to the cost to crash test the vehicle was cost prohibitive because the vehicle was a million five, and they refused to crash test it. Right. So the economic benefit that could possibly be achieved was negative. Okay. Um, 
I, uh, I had a, uh, my, my consulting firm had a, had a, did a lot of work in computer telephony for, for, uh, for a lot of years. Built some very notorious systems. That's another story. Um, one of the things that we, uh, we worked on for one of our customers was um, some telephony systems that did uh, things like conference bridges, this, this kind of uh, audio text system. So there's various degrees of switching and voice processing and DTMF processing. And, um, and these things are extremely hard to test because uh, they're very, very, very timing sensitive. It's very hard to test all the combinations of people punching digits at exactly the same time the call is experiencing uh, who knows what. So for them, what they did was they had, a, uh, they had a written test plan, which was basically a unit test of the major features. And they had monitoring for these things, which told them the statistics of calls in real time. So what they would do is they would roll out new software on a limited number of machines, some subset of the server farm. And they would look at the statistics. And if all the calls got really short, something wasn't working, turn it off, go look at the logs, figure it out, load the old version of software, and people get cut off on calls and they'd say, all right. But no economic, no economic consequence, right? You cut a few people off on a conference call. Right? What's a conference call with? A buck? Two bucks? Right? So it wasn't like they didn't do any testing, but they didn't do what we would consider high quality automated testing. And they did manage the operations in a, in a, in a, in a sensible fashion. And if they did have a problem, they had logging in place so they could look and they could see the event stream and they could see what happened and reconstruct any kind of failed calls that, that had occurred. Which didn't happen very often because these weren't hugely complicated systems, but it did, it did happen. So there, there's an example where, you know, it, it's not economically helpful to do uh, very, very complicated testing because, you know, that's what customers are for, right? What economic reason do we have for testing at Comstock? Reputation. Reputation? Well, we also think less rework and more positive knowledge. Less rework. What's the economic consequence if we, we send out data that's not, we screw up some exchange and we send out stuff that's pretty dicey? Cancellations. Cancellations. How many times do we have to screw it up before we lose customers? Once. Depends on how bad it is. Depends on the customer. The customer. Well, I'm asking about Comstock customers, okay? Not because yeah. FTID is a different. different yeah, it's a, it's a huge continuum. I mean, you can't yeah. say that. But uh, yes, in extreme cases, once is enough. Yeah. In, in other cases, it may be happening every day and somebody doesn't pay attention. So it depends on the market you serve. And um, you know, if you're looking at the extreme of the market that's just, you know, taking whatever you send down the pipe and putting it on a website and who the hell cares if it's correct. And you've got sort of one extreme of, you know, what's, what's the economic consequence. We'll come back to the other point later because that's real, that, that, that other point is important also. But in terms of the overall economic consequence of delivering something out that's not, uh, you know, super. FTAD is kind of the other end of the spectrum from that because of especially the funds business. Um, you got a lot of people already know this, but maybe some of the Comstock folks, folks don't. If we have a funds delivery problem at FTID, um, in the worst case, what was the word you used? Spectacular? Spectacular. Spectacular event. <laughs> the, we haven't had any really, really spectacular events for a while now. Um, there were. I. When was the last time? When was the last last <laughs> really spectacular? Event? I mean, I've had to go on apology tours for some of our fairly exciting events, um, but we haven't. I mean, you know, it's got to the it's point. Years. You know, it's been it's been a few years. But in, if we have a delivery problem, or any kind of our systems are not doing what they're supposed to, and we can't get out the funds problem, what what happens is um, several thousand people have to work late trying to figure out what to do about the valuation of the funds that are taking these prices. And then the companies that are doing the 
uh, doing the fund processing, the, you know, the processing companies that are our customers, miss their SLAs with their customers. Their customers may in turn be fined by the SEC if they have some number of events where they're not meeting the reporting requirements. I get to go on apology tours. Not one of my favorite things. Um, it, it's a very, a very severe thing, I, and I think when you know, when in the dark days, uh, three, four years ago, whenever there was a really bad state, it was literally printed in the Wall Street Journal. Prices are missing on this page due to processing problems at Interactive Data Corporation on every page. What, do you remember yeah. that, what year that was? That, well, that was about three, three four years ago. So then what happens in the, in, the, uh, in the FTID world is that all of the salespeople spend all of their time for some significant period of time running around apologizing to people and promising we won't do anything. They don't have any basis on which we make that promise, but they do it with a heartfelt effort. Anyway, that's their job. I can't imagine. They do it. Um, and um, they don't sell anything because they spend all their time apologizing. And so it has a very significant effect on our bottom line directly in new sales and in reputation. And it takes a while to dig out from underneath one of those. So um, it, it, is a, it is a very, very serious uh, event for us not to, uh, not to meet our end-of-day pricing objectives uh, for the funds. So that puts us at a different place on the, on the continuum in terms of what we, what we can tolerate and how much we need to make sure that we have uh, really, really good testing. As, as we try and grow more in the, into the institutional space, that becomes more and more the, the side of the continuum that we need to focus on. And we have, well, the, you know, we have that kind of economic pressure where you know, we just can't, can't make a mistake. I touched on a little bit in some of these stories the, the, the notion that you, you need to um, sometimes actually change what you're building in order to make it testable. And uh, you really need to, uh, you need to design your systems in such a way to make them testable. So my favorite example, which plagues us at IDC, but I've seen in a million places before, is the use of, for example, today's date in software. Right, so, for example, if you have a program whose job it is to worry about, I don't know, dividend processing of bonds or something, how are you going to test this thing if it always just takes today's date? Every time you run it, it's going to behave differently, right? You need to be able to control some aspects of the environment of, the, of, of, of what you're doing in order to be able to do proper testing. So the date, is a, that's a constant gotcha. That comes up all over the place. It comes up on um, holidays. Holidays around FTID are, are kind of a scary time because uh, Rodney knows because you know something special happens and it's really hard to test that something special if your systems aren't designed to be tested as of a particular date, right? So there 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 is a, a necessity as. Uh, as, as, we, as we design systems, to really think about, you know, it's not just enough to have a system that works. You can't actually get there and, and keep it there if you haven't made accommodations like this in the way that you've implemented in order to be able to control enough of the environment to be able to run tests of those things that you, you need to test. So sure enough, in the BAT project in the UK, we had to go back and rip out, I don't know how many hundred system dates that were used in SQL queries and in the processing, uh, processing of the applications in order to be able to test these applications properly. Um, the flip side of that is that you need to have a testing environment that will allow you to easily manage those environmental parameters which are required in order to be able to do the test. So the way I like to try and construct these things is basically to have uh, essentially a single script that incorporates the input data stream, things that need to be kind of controlled out of band, like the date, the time, and commentary so that you can make the stuff self-documenting. When you think about engineering a piece of software, you, you, you gotta think about, okay, how am I gonna create a test environment that allows me to do that? 
I've got to be able to easily manage my tests, document my tests, and control those aspects which, which, which influence. So if we think about a parser and a database, they're probably going to have some interesting behavior around the beginning of the day and the end of the day and reset behavior and things like that that may require the test environment where you're trying to generate a test script to be able to set those things and to control those in addition to just here's the data flowing in the pipe. Right? Does it make sense? Nobody's saying anything. Yeah, okay. Everybody I'm sorry? Everybody's agreeing. I think everybody needs coffee. I try to, to, to reduce the experiences that I've, I've had and all of the, the ones I've shared with you and a hundred others that I haven't. It boils down to a few things that I consider just basic axioms of software engineering. Okay. First of all, before you start designing anything, and certainly before you start building anything, figure out how you're going to test it. Design the test cases first. Right? Write the test cases and the test framework prior to writing application code. Right? What happens when you do that? The amount of time that you spend writing that test framework and putting those tests together, you will save in debugging your program. You will have a net savings in cost for the initial implementation of that program. Now you maintain those tests going forward. Find another bug, add another test case. Make a change, keep the test cases updated to match it. And you will save on an ongoing basis every single time you do a release by having the ability to do regression tests simply and easily. The process of testing shouldn't be those guys or those guys' problem. If you think about the stories I've told you where the QA department was like, you know, it's like the QA ghetto, you know, it's like toss it over the wall to those guys, they'll figure it out. You know, the QA department is an integral part of what we do. It has to be really, you know, we have to, we have to really work together to make sure we have the tools to make sure the software has all of the aspects that it needs to make it really testable, right? Whether it's tools to manage the input stream and set the date and change the time or whatever, or whatever other kind of, of test hooks that you might need in some of the examples I gave you. You know, the ability to, from the testing environment, initialize the database that the thing runs from so you always have a known starting case. You know, these things are, are fundamental and they're not development's job or QA's job. We gotta, we gotta work together in order to be able to arrive at a solution that works for all of us. The developers need to be able to run the test cases, right? If you can run the test cases while you're developing stuff, you find the bugs immediately and you know you fixed them immediately and you know you didn't break anything else immediately. The QA department needs to be responsible for worrying along with the data experts. What's this thing supposed to do and do we have the kind of test coverage that we think is necessary in order to do a sensible job of testing it. You're not going to test everything, right? You've got to figure out the appropriate breadth, the appropriate depth, what things you're going to worry about, what things you're not going to worry about. You know? I saw a case, be careful here, somebody spent a whole bunch of time writing a very complicated test script to test you know, the different kinds of logon scenarios for the application. Who cares about that? Worry about the functionality. That's the thing that's going to cause us the real, you know, that's where the real meat of it is. Worry, you know, make sure we're testing the stuff that's, that's important, where there's the real cost. I mean, yeah, it's going to be embarrassing if somebody breaks the logon screen, but, you know, you shouldn't write 30 tests for the logon screen, right? You got you to try and figure out how to, how, to, how to balance that. The QA department has to really focus on that with the data experts, right? The application experts to make sure that this thing is framed sensibly. One question within that, Dave. <clears throat> Do you see it as solely the developer's role to produce the pre-designed 
stab at the test cases, no. or is that a no. QA support? No, that should, that, that's got nothing to do with the developers. The developers, um, the, the time when the developer is, is likely going to be messing around with test cases is the time when the developer realizes, wait a second, there's something that's a little bit, uh, for, for example, maybe there's a bug report. What you'd really like to see is you'd like the bug report to come to the QA department. The QA department creates a test case that illustrates the bug and the expected result if it weren't buggy and gives that to development. Right? Everybody's on the same page. We know exactly what we're trying to do. Data experts work with the QA experts, put the test case and the expected answer together. And then when it gets to development, it's a lot of work to reproduce the problem. I mean, you know, a lot of a lot of times it takes a horrendous amount of time to figure out how to reproduce the problem. Once you've gone to the trouble of figuring out how to reproduce the problem, for heaven's sakes, you want to automate it so that you have an easy way to, you know, try this fix and try this other fix and whoops, I broke something else. And, you know, sometimes it takes more than one try. Right? But it's not a, it's not no, it's not a development responsibility. The development responsibility to me is make it easy. Right? Provide the tools to make this easy for the QA department, for the data experts, and the developers. Right? So in some cases, that's the application itself has to be a little different. You've got to have some way to jam the date into the thing, the time into the thing, or whatever. In some cases, it's external tools to manage the data flowing into the application, or to take the data out of the application and compare it to the known results. Or maybe it's to format the input and output data so that you know, humans can actually read it and make some sense out of it as opposed to you know, looking at some inscrutable binary compressed thing, which may be what the, the real input and output of the component that you're testing is. Right. Thoughts? Ideas? While developing, you can, you know, in, when I'm developing a code, it is better to have a test code. When I'm developing the code, then you know, I can write you know, much more elegant or a little more tougher code. You know, I will get that confidence that you know it will work. So I can, you know, you you know try some you know seemingly difficult but elegant code. If you have, if I have test code, you know, with that while developing that code. Yeah. What else? What else does that really help? What What are the things can you can you do with a lot more confidence if you have a good set of tests? One of the problems that we have as 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 software engineers as as programs evolve is we we find that we need to uh, we need to continue to change them to meet new requirements, right? We end up having to do a lot of refactoring. We may want to make some somewhat drastic changes. This morning we were talking about, okay, well, how are we going to get past the, um, I'm sorry, I'm going to get the acronyms wrong, guys. Uh, is it the uh, CI? PP. PP. You know, how are we going to get past the limitations? Is it the CIM or CIPP that's got the CIPP? How are we going to get past the limitations of the CIPP? You know, how do we refactor all these moving parts? Got really good test cases for all this stuff. You can do that with a lot less fear, right, and a lot less excitement. Yeah, that, that's that's a, you know, if you have a test case, you know, it will be more exciting to write a code because we know it's all working. You know, when we are writing the code, you know, we don't have to, you know, go, uh, wait for some kind of big bang. You know, sending all this stuff. You know, it's not working now. Right. And the frustrating situation is very less if you test, you know, incrementally. With test code in your, you know, beside your source code. Yeah. So, the counterexample is um, what happens when we we don't we don't have those things in place. And we had a little bit of this in the in the SD project. We, we suffered a little bit from this, where we had a developer who had a specification. He made the best of it, but he didn't actually talk to the people in the data department, and there was no set of use cases that was written. I mean, really, ideally, you want to have use cases directly leading to automated test cases that are packaged up and maintained and given to the developer. And then as the developer has a question about this, you go back, you figure it out, you augment the test cases, everybody works together to build that, that body up, right? What happened was do some stuff, toss it over the wall, sometime later, somebody looks at the output, whoops, that's no good, right? In the worst case, they didn't even have a written test plan for a particular feed and had to recreate it in a number of a number of cases. Right? Very expensive, very time consuming to have that kind of iteration. Right? So that's kind of you know where where it, it, it sort of brought it to, into focus for us, looking at okay, you know, 
why are we having such high costs and as we're looking at the next phases of integration, well, hey, here's why we're having, having high costs and why it, 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 takes, it takes a long time to, uh, to actually make these changes and you know, get too many iterations. You know, we can cut down the number of iterations and we can cut down the delay from the time the change comes in to the time it goes out the door. Testing is, is uh, one piece of what we sort of generally refer to as, as, as best practices. And uh, one of the most astonishing things to me, which I shouldn't be astonished after hearing it so many times, but, but uh, this is a continual thing that happens, is the first reaction to suggesting these kinds of approaches in many, many cases is it's too expensive. We don't have time for that. If you think about the stories I told you about, those are kind of extreme examples. But in those cases, not only was it less expensive than the alternative, there was no alternative. They were completely stuck in a number of these situations because of not following reasonable practices and following the lessons that have been learned so many times throughout industry. This is true for testing, and it's true for a lot of the other aspects of, of best practices. And so, you know, I think that each of us, in, in thinking of ourselves as development professionals, will have to realize that that, that, is a, that is an issue. And the real answer is, sure, it's expensive. And it's a hell of a lot less expensive than the alternatives. And that goes, that goes up and down for the, the things that we're doing as, as best practices. So code reviews, for example, I know that you're, you're rolling out code reviews. Takes time, takes effort. Yeah, but if you cross-train the staff, catch a bunch of bugs so that they don't go out to the QA department and result in yet another iteration, or worse yet, out to a customer, You save money, save time. Personally, I would much rather have one of my colleagues find that I forgot to check an error code or I did some other nastiness than to have a customer find out. And um, that's sort of a, a kind of a professional attitude thing. I mean, to me, these are these are things which are they're they're, they're kind of fundamental and they're they're uh, um, they're the things that that we, we just do as, as professionals. I, I made a, a quick list. You know, we talked about the sort of the axioms of testing, but you know, just to run down the list, specification should be use cases for testing. Create tests before coding. Design, te design for test we talked about. Always do code reviews and design reviews. Much less expensive than the alternative. All it takes is one or two good mistakes that didn't get caught. It's going to take you a lot more time to fix it than you would have spent on the code review or the design. Source control pretty much goes without saying. You'd be surprised. It needs to be said in some, some sort of Do not tolerate poor quality code. Refactor. Because it's going to come back to bite you. Might as well meet it head on sooner rather than later. Practice continual refactoring and improvement. Can't do that if you don't have the testing in place. It's too scary. Don't touch that. Right? What happens? You get into a cut and paste mentality, you get into all kind of code everybody's afraid to, to, to touch. Stuff gets much more expensive and harder to maintain. Right? So your costs just take off. Automate your testing, we certainly talked about that. Always use a pre-production environment similar to production. We don't do that at IDC for all of our systems. And we have fairly regular excitement where we don't. Right? You guys remember what happened when we tried to roll out the seed oil change? Oops. Pretty exciting. We don't need that kind of excitement. Keep software tools and components current. If you're running an eight-year-old version of a compiler, 
and you have to update that piece of code, you're going to really have a problem. So it's going to, you're going to incur a big cost to get caught up. Do it incrementally. The changes are smaller, and so you're going to have less excitement. You should have a decent testing framework in place to be able to do that. Right. Change control. Change control is, uh, covers a lot of different, a lot of different things, but um, one of the most important things that I, I actually was surprised to find out in some of our areas, it's more important to have good change control than to do almost anything else. And in particular, it's important to have the ability to back out your changes and to detect if there's a problem sooner rather than later. Okay, so for example, in EBS, what we do now, what we used to do, but what we do now, is most evaluation systems are, are done with a dry run early in the morning. And what that does is it not only tells us we didn't break any of the software last night, it also tells us that most of the feeds that we need are in place. You know, there's no missing data that nobody's flagged. Um, it, it, it covers all kinds of different, different problems. And if we did install some new software last night, we find out first thing in the morning and we back it out and we have backup plans in place. So change control is, it's not just all of the, you know, what do we do with two toss? It's, it's, it's all that kind of, you know, how do you, how do you make sure that you have, uh, it's a little harder when you have synchronized changes across a bunch of components, I know. Um, segregation of production and development. We have not done that across IDC, so we have a lot of work cut out for us in some areas to, to bring that to, to reality. Um, invest in continual staff training and learning. I think we, we're pretty good about that in most, most cases, certainly in my, my department. And don't put up with short circuiting these rules. What we need to do as software professionals is to understand that these things are what it means to be a professional. Thank you very much. Questions, comments, thoughts? In the back. Well, you just went through. Could you uh, just keep people uh, uh, distributed? Sorry? Uh, all this you just went through. Could you email that to some few people so it can be distributed? Sure. OK. Will do. Questions? Thoughts? So, I have a question. Go ahead. Uh, do you think it's a developer's job to build a list for the module dependence? For example, uh, as a QA, we want to create some um, migration uh, test cases and based on the module dependencies. Mm -hmm. So who is who should be responsible to build this kind of list so we can map the module into the files? For example, if any files get changed, then we can find out which module is being what affected. Are you going to retest, so, right? Yeah, so who is responsible to come out with this kind of document? Um, I'm going to kind of punt on, on answering that question. You know, who's, who's responsible for figuring out which pieces need to be retested after a change? Um, I think the key thing as a professional is to make sure that we have a procedure in place for making sure it doesn't fall through the cracks. And it doesn't like bother me who's responsible for it. It bothers me if nobody's responsible for it. Right? So it's figure something out that works for however the organization is, is, is set up. Um, how in practice have you worked out how much testing you should do versus the time you have versus the economics of it, so to speak? In practice, how have you worked that out? How have you worked out the break economic uh, economic decision making? That's a tough one. I wish I could I wish I could like you know give you give you some, uh, some easy rules of thumb. I, I've never really sat down and tried to develop any rules of thumb. Mostly it's been, okay, look at this situation, what's gonna work? And you just try and work through, okay, if we don't do it, what's gonna happen? How much is it gonna cost? How much automation do we need in order to be, do, you know, to, to try and find a, a sweet spot given the economic consequences of making a mistake? You know, again, if the economic consequences of a mistake are very, very low, you're not going to spend so much on it, right? Some of it you're going to do anyway, because frankly, if it takes you eight tries to fix something because you don't have enough testing in place, right? Even if there's no economic consequence to the customer, there's an economic consequence to you 
in terms of how many times do you, do you try to fix that stupid bug, right? So it's, a, it's, a, it's kind of a balancing act. You're not just looking at the economics downstream, you're looking at the economics just within development and QA. Is that a successful dodge of answering your questions? I'm sorry. I guess I was thinking more on how far to take the regression testing when you do a smaller set of changes. If you come up with any rules of thumb that appears to work, in theory, any change will break the whole thing. In theory. But yet, at some point, regression testing can be really expensive. If it's probably not automated, it can be very expensive. But if it's automated, I think it costs could be curtailed down. Thank you. I'm just not meaning not so much what you say theoretically, but how you work it out in practice. Right. Um, yeah, I get, I get your, I get your, get your question. Just sort of, how do you, how do you, in practice, come to a reasonable balance? Mm -hmm. um, I think you just have to kind of, kind of look at it and again work out. You know, what are the things, what are the things that give us trouble? All right. So, you know, don't spend all your time testing the product gateway if you get like one bug every six years there. Right. You know, should be included in, in some stress tests that you're going to do on a regular basis. Well, yeah, but don't spend all your QA time building tests for it, right? What are the things where we have a lot of change and therefore a lot of risk and a lot of problems? So what stuff are you constantly having to fool around with and therefore it's, it's real expensive not to have, have, have good tests in place and start there. Start where you've got a lot of change and or a lot of risk and then work from there. I agree. I mean, it, you know, it's a case by case basis, but it all comes down and revolves around risk, risk management. You know, in time, so if you have an uh, X amount of days actually to release, come up with all right, what well, coverage you really need to do in order to reduce the risk the most. Have you know enough time to expand the coverage and then go deeper and so forth. I found that it's always case by case basis. You know that call of coverage, um, risk management. Yeah, I think there's another. When you design it in the beginning, it's also you got to think about not have too many components that it, it could screw up the whole system. You know, we can't afford that. So like, you kind of design it like in, in this, this thread. So yeah, that particular thread can screw up. But there's nothing that you can do that's going to screw up any other part. So you can't always do that. But I think some of that has to be taken into account in your initial design so that there's no code that's going to screw up everything else. You, you can't. You're only going to screw up your own little, your own little piece. Well, hopefully, you know, systems are modular enough in their construction so that that's. Um, there are always ways where you can cause unex, unex, unexpected, um, uh, unfortunate consequences, um, and they're hard to catch. Um, it's, it's always, always a possibility. I guess one thing I didn't really talk about a lot here is, you know, I, 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 spent, a, I spent a bunch of time talking about systems you're designing from scratch, but not stuff that's already existing. And um, for the stuff that's already existing, I think it, 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 it speaks, Larry, to your, your question and, and a little bit what, what Michael was saying. You know, you got to say, well, you can't, you know, you can't just stop everything you're doing and spend all of your, your time and money on it. You'll die. You'll go out of business, right? So. Where's the big ban? You know, where, where's the big benefit? What things can we do? You know, is it mostly the parsers? Oh, parsers are pretty self-contained. Right? The tooling required to do that is pretty, pretty easy to get a grip on. You'd like to do the parsers and the parsers in the database and the parsers on out to the CSP. But where are we going to see the biggest benefit? What pieces should we do first? And just do it progressively. You know, keep nipping away at it, and and iteratively see where. Where you can get the next, next biggest piece of benefit, and it's not necessarily because of what you've seen in the past. It may be because you've got a bunch of changes to some code coming up, and you really want to make sure that you've got tests in place, even if it's a piece of code that's existing, before you go refactoring or making big changes. Make sure you've got good good tests in place. So you got to kind of do it uh, in, in, a, in a pragmatic fashion and be prepared that you're going to continue to iterate on. On this stuff forever, it never it never stops any more than the evolution of the core ticker plant stops. I think the thing is you've got to remember that we don't sell the systems; we sell the content. And in terms of testing, you want to focus. I feel you want to focus the testing where you have your most 
where the business logic is, because that's where it hurts. That's where the content gets screwed up. That's where we have the problems. So the testing needs to be focused where the business logic is, because that's that's what bites us every time. So that's mostly parser and rebus, some CSP. Yeah. So we concentrate first on the parser, and then the parser and the rebus, and then. I think probably more on the rebus side. The parsers, I think, are pretty straightforward in terms of what they do. It's how it's interpreted downstream. You know, I think the problem's probably all that. Brian, thoughts? Uh, yeah, I would say it's not that cut and dry. Um, obviously, nothing is, but um, parser and rebus are, you know, they're one and the same. Uh, parser sets rebus up, so if the parser's faulty, rebus will be faulty, um, or perhaps do something screwy. Uh, but you know, the hard part there is you want to you also want to try and keep business logic in pain to make some of this stuff easier um, because the more distributed the business logic is, the harder this becomes and the interactions become harder to understand. Uh, and, and that's an aspect uh, today that I think that we could do a better job. Yeah. Any other thoughts, comments, questions? I think kickstarting this is uh, probably complex. I mean, uh, Brian is pure leading that. And, People know, but the idea is uh, um, it's difficult to go to 30, 40 developers and saying starting tomorrow you're all going to be writing test cases yeah, and never gonna framework <coughs> and shell scripts to do automatic differences and so forth. So you want to start with a pilot project that we are doing, but um, of course the challenge there is you can usually with enough management attention succeed in a pilot project. You know, the, the thing is to get it out to where it becomes a machine in an organization. That's difficult. If you have any experience of where you, you've done that and it worked, um, that would be interesting. Yeah, it's it's kind of funny because in, in some ways, you know, you think about some of the stories I told you, when it's a complete utter disaster, it's easier. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they already threw up their hands and said, just do whatever you need to do, exactly. fix it. It's easy to convince that the current way doesn't work. Yeah. Um, I think to some extent, it sounds a little corny, but it, it almost catches fire and builds momentum and reaches like a critical mass on its own. I think you're seeing the same thing with the code reviews, right? We started small a little bit, but as people get more and more into them, they recognize the value. It's just because you're not, almost not going to consider not doing it. So yeah, you might start as a small core team, but that team will consider not doing the test cases and et cetera. Uh, the code reviews are pretty widespread now, but I still find that they need constant effort to, to, to keep them running. You know, the, there's always a temptation in a, in a very high urgency project, and what project is not, um, to skip it. Um, I, I think we do it for the majority of our projects, but, but you know, there, there's always a risk. So I don't see it really catching fire so much as being constantly being reinforced. Well, it's also a question of uh, people coming to the realization that this is part of what it means to be a professional, is to keep working at these things. You know, we can be, um, you know, dumb programmerators that just hack away, or we can be, uh, you know, we can be professionals. It's, it's really our choice. You have to go to meetings for weeks on end if you screw up. That's the other one. Well, I certainly do anyway. Yeah. Uh, to put on the tie. Where does this not apply, if I am? I, one, one thing I can think of is uh, user interface type projects where there's a significant prototyping and the testability of the user interface actually is in the eye of the beholder. Yeah. Um, prototyping, it, it depends. User interfaces are uh, a, a, strange, a strange thing. Um, historically, a lot of thick applications, um, for example, Windows platform, uh, have been built in a manner where a lot of effective business logic is, is built into the GOI code. And this creates lots and lots and lots of problems, um, of which testability is only, only one. Um, to the extent that you segregate business logic out into separate objects that are then you know, used however you want to arrange your user interface on top of that, and you can test those components separately, um, you, you, have, uh, you tend to have better luck with that. Um, certainly, uh, let, me, let me give some examples of things that, uh, that we're trying to do across IDC, um, or FTID anyway. Um, in some cases, we run dual hot systems. And so what that means is, the user interface actually needs to feed multiple systems, right? So if you don't 
design from the beginning that the user interface emits some fairly you know well-defined thing which can go off to multiple places mm -hmm. you know then you can't actually do that but if you do do that well then you have a nice well-defined thing that drives the server applications that's very easy to use for testing so for example in the BAT application the client application that the user sees actually generates a humongous XML string at the end of all kind of fussing around and it's got all kind of edit rules and all kind of things that are loaded in the user interface but when it's done it spits out this giant piece of XML that basically says uh, what happened with, with, the, with the edits. So they have a, a capture replay facility that they can use for testing, and they can also use it to run to multiple copies of the server mm -hmm. and to log it for problems and such. So, um, and the focus on testing there isn't on the GUI, which is a problem because we always break something every time we roll out a new GUI. We have a bug or two that gets past us. Uh, but really the focus is on all the other processing that happens behind the scenes. And by segregating the business logic, you know, you have a fairly, it's not like it's not a rich GUI, but it's, it's in terms of the overall functionality of those systems, it's, it's, a, it's a relatively, uh, well, the GUI developers would shoot me, but you know, it's not, it's not a huge percentage of the, of the important functionality. So. But um, certainly um, a number of these, of these stories I told you were, very rich GUI applications. And the biggest problem in those things was actually in some cases we really did have to uh, change the way the GUI was implemented in order to work with the testing tools. So um, and we have this kind of problems all over the place. If you start late, then you always end up having to retrofit stuff. If you do the testing at the beginning, then you, you, know, you don't end up with these holes where you have to go back and, and retrofit things. So a stupid example that came up a few weeks ago, for example, uh, um, they used the same, one of the applications used the same uh, caption text for a, a huge number of dialog boxes, which was basically the name of the application as opposed to the name of the application plus what's this dialog box about. They always put the text below it. And then the testing tool, tool got all confused because it couldn't figure out what dialog it was matching. Okay, so we had to go back and change the application. It's nothing that anybody cares about as a user. So, but you wouldn't not use a, use a GUI testing tool for those kind of applications. It's got a lot of logic built into it. So all gets tested as a law. And we are gradually rolling it out. So the developers have access to the smoke tests and the more detailed tests as they're developed. Uh, that's in the evaluation area in New York. We're doing that for a couple of evaluation systems. Okay. Um, 